through that for us. And I knew this would be a weekend where a lot of people would be coming in here thinking about the cross. And I just thought the worst thing I could do is to take your mind off of the cross and make you think about anything other than the cross. Um, because what, what is more worthy to think about than what God did for us? Jesus says, you know, this is why I give you this, this bread. This, this, this bread is my body. I, I wanted, when, when you break it, I want you to think about my body that was broken, torn open for you. And this cup is to remind you of, of the blood that was shed for you. And he wanted us to remember, to, to remember the new covenant in his blood. He wanted us to remember these things because, because we don't. We, we, we have so many other things in our heads. And, and the last thing I want to do is put something new in your mind. I want you to think about the cross. Think about what God's done for you. How many saw the movie this week? Okay, most of you. And, uh, and I talked to some people who said uh, after the movie they just wanted to go away somewhere and just be by themselves, not talk to anyone, just find a cave and just sit there and think about everything God's done for them. But what happened instead was they got distracted. Cell phone rang or, you know, got an argument or, you know, Johnny, one of our pastors, got in a car accident right afterwards. And, and just, you know, he says, man, just took my mind off of everything. I just, I just want to stay focused. But the thing is, is Satan doesn't want us to think about the cross. Because when we think about the cross, so many things change in our lives. So many things are impacted. You know, I, I, I think about, uh, you know, because when you deal with the cross, you, you have to, you, there's, there's some serious questions. See, a lot of people don't even think through life. They don't even think through, okay, who was Jesus? They just kind of quickly go, well, he was a good man. He was just a good man. He was a good teacher. Well, then you've got to deal with the cross. Think about the cross. Why would he go to the cross then? I mean, you'd have to say that he's a foolish man. Because he went to the cross claiming to be the Son of God. And so he went through all of that torture for nothing. I mean, a good man, a good teacher doesn't say, I'm the Son of God, and then allow people to beat him to a pulp and, and nail him to a cross. You know, you have to say, no, he's a liar. He was a liar. And I, I had only one person in, in, in my lifetime willing to come up to me and say, no, I believe Jesus was a liar. That he just pretended he was the Son of God, knowing that he wasn't. And so then he was a foolish liar because then he, it was his lie that God had nailed to the cross. And so he went through all of that torture the whole time going, this isn't true, this isn't true, but I'm going to do it anyways. Because I'm fooling everyone who took the worst of it. Why would you do that? You have to deal with the cross. You guys, I'm just being really honest with you right now. This, uh, this has been the hardest morning for me. I am just an absolute emotional basket case today. I haven't been able to speak. Um, and when am I at a loss for words, you know? But I, I got here today at, at 8.45 or so. Or I walked in this room at 8.45 and started looking around. And, and I saw some people I didn't expect to see here today. And uh, even at this service, you know, I... You know, the Bible says that when uh, one part of the body is hurting, how the whole body grieves. And how, you know, like if I stub my toe, my whole body would be in agony right now. And, uh, and the Bible says that's the way it ought to be in the church. That when one part rejoices, the whole body rejoices with that one part. If one part suffers, then the whole body suffers with that one part. And, uh, and this has been a pretty heavy week. Um, for Roger and Kim Armstrong, whose son was murdered this Tuesday. Um, it's, uh, we had the service here yesterday and I, I just think about the wife, Tara, sitting here in the front row and just her face and just the pain and just, you know, what does that feel like? Her best friend, 31 years old, to be shot. You know, right there, you get, a lot of you guys read about it on the news and on First Street there and, and yet it's real. It's, it's a life and, and Eve and just, I, I just sit and think, 
of my kids and, and my wife and think about what would she do if we lost a child and just that, that feeling of just, just pain and just hurt and then to come Sunday morning and say, but I'm going to go and worship my God. Also at last service at 9 o'clock in the front row right here in the corner seat was, was Dunbar. And a lot of you guys know Dunbar, a guy that had been coming to church for a, for a long time. On, uh, on Thursday night, his 16-year-old daughter went to bed and came back in his room an hour later and said, Daddy, I'm having a hard time breathing. He called the paramedics, held her in his arms until she died. And where is he Sunday morning? Sitting right here, front row, worshiping the Lord. Last week we talked about how how Job went through his trials and uh, and at the end of them looks at his wife and says, "Look, I'm not just going to take the good and not not the not the difficult, not the adversity, not the evil." He goes, "I'm not going to just take the good and not the bad." He goes, "Blessed be the name of the Lord." And it's one thing to study a guy's life; it's another thing to have Job in your service and try to speak as he's sitting in the front row after holding his daughter for the last moments of her life. And, uh, and I tell you, then, you know, we have this time during service where we're praying and worshiping, and during that time, Dunbar asks if he can speak and share with the congregation about his daughter. And I give him the microphone, and I tell you, game over. I mean, you just, you, you listen to a guy who says, this was the love of my life, and... Uh, he would talk about how he'd go on dates with his daughter three times a week and just couldn't get enough of her. And how, uh, but he talked about her faith. He talked about how she would, she would, uh, he said he could open the Bible and just read a verse and she could tell you the context of it and tell you what happened before or after. How, how she could just quote to you and tell you everything that's going to happen in the end times chronologically. How she just, she knew the Word of God and how she memorized the Word of God. He told me about how no one knew about this, but ever since she was 12, she had been supporting orphans out in Africa with the money that she would make. And, uh, and she would be giving money to missionaries at age 12, all the way up until 16. And how she wasn't like your typical teenager that wanted all this stuff. And you know, talk about how she, uh, she wanted to just give it all away. And, and her favorite verse is he was reading from Matthew 6 about how she didn't want to store up treasures on earth, but she wanted treasures in heaven and how she was going to those treasures now. And uh, I tell you, that, that was just intense. That was so intense just to sit and listen to this guy talk about his daughter as... As many of us, you know, fathers who have little girls, you just relate and you think, I, I cannot imagine that. I, it would only be the grace of God that would keep me out from some insane asylum right now. You know, the same bond, you know, that I'm sure a mother and son have that, that you know, just in my head, I just relate because I just go, man, my little Rachie, there's no way I couldn't handle that. And for him to sit here and talk about her life and her passion for God. And last night, just talking to some of her friends that said, you know, she, uh, every time I went over to the house, she was talking about friends that, that she was talking to about Christ. You know, a 16-year-old who died Thursday night, Friday, her brother and her dad go back to the high school and ask the school officials if they could have a memorial service that day on the high school for some of her friends. And, uh, and they work up enough courage to lead this memorial service at her, her brother and dad preaching the gospel to these students. And, and about 10 students gave their lives to the Lord. And I, I just look at these guys and I'm going, so your daughter died on Thursday. You're preaching at her school on Friday. You're sitting here Sunday morning worshiping God for the cross. That's the real thing. And I, I just, 
there's a sense of joy, you know, when a, when a loved one passes away and you know and you're sure of their commitment to the Lord. Um, and I bring these things up, and some go, well, why, why do you bring up stuff like this at church, you know? And, and yet for me, you know, I was thinking about this passage when I was driving over to the Moore Park Church a few minutes ago in, uh, in Ecclesiastes. Um, there's this, this is verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, where King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, next to Jesus Christ himself, he says... Uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2, listen to this. He says, It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man, and the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. Isn't that an incredible passage? He says it's, it's better, it's healthier for us to deal with some of these issues. It's better for us to go into a house of mourning than to go into a house of feasting. That is not something you would hear from our society. I mean, everything's about partying and just having a good time, and it's all about laughing. Let's come to church and do the same thing. You know, don't, don't get me down. Don't get me thinking about death. Don't get me thinking about anything difficult right now. And yet what the Word of God says, you know what? It's better for your soul to deal with death because he says the living need to take this to heart. Those of us who are still alive need to recognize this is any one of us, that, that life just changes overnight. You know, have a great time with your daughter, not knowing so that this is going to be the last day that I'll see her. And, and to wake up one morning with the horrible news uh, about your son. And, and to me, you know, dealing with these things, it again points me to the cross because, I, you know, there are people who say, well, you know, yes, I believe that this was the Son of God, okay? I, I don't think that it was a hoax. I don't think he was a liar. I really think he was the Son of God and that he died so that we could go to heaven. But you know what? There are many ways to heaven. And when I think about this, the pain that, that these, these, these parents are going through, I think about the Father and I, I say, okay, so you're telling me that God the Father, the most loving Father, the, the awesome relationship he had with his one and only Son, that he looks down at his son on the earth, and his earth there in the garden, you know, dripping, sweating blood, is looking at the father and saying, is there any other way? Is there any other way to pay for the sins of these people? Is there any other way? You know, can you, can you take this cup from me? I, I don't want to go through with this. He knows the pain ahead, and he goes, gosh, Lord, is there any way, any other way? And, and you're telling me that the Father up in heaven looks at his Son and goes, well, you know what, there are many ways. There are many ways to heaven, and this is just going to be another one. I'm going to watch you go through all this torture, really for no reason. Because people could have gone to heaven, they could have been forgiven in many other ways, but I just want to watch you go through this torture. Anyone who is a parent knows that that's a stupid, stupid argument. Because when, you're, when you lose someone unwillingly, your own child, and the pain and the grief of that, you, you, you think, how could I willingly do it? And not just willingly do it, but willingly watch the suffer and the passion of my son. And can I do that for no reason, as there are many other ways to heaven? No, the Bible is clear. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus had to die for my sins. And, and you know, I, I, I'm, I'm watching, uh, you know, I'm watching the movie, and I, the whole time I just want to scream, you know, you just get so angry, you're like, knock it off, knock it off, quit hitting him. And you get so angry at those people, and then suddenly it just hits you, and you go, ah, it's my fault. I'm the one that's doing that. And it's like, it's not the Romans. It's not the Jews. It's me. And any Christian knows that. Any true believer knows that. And you start going, God, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He went through that for me. He was being punished for everything I did wrong. God made him who knew no sin become sin on my behalf that I might become the righteousness of God through him. 
And, and then you just start getting mad at yourself. And you just you start looking at all of your sin. You see, that's what the cross does. It, it makes us aware of all the garbage in our own lives going, I did that to him. It, it brings us to confession. It, it causes some of you who maybe have never thought through the cross, it, it, makes, you, it makes you think about, well, well, who was Jesus then? And people are asking that question for the first time since I'm alive. People are just willingly talking about the cross and talking about Jesus. What an incredible, incredible opportunity. Why? Because as people look at the cross and they think about what Jesus went through, they've got to grapple with. Some of you, you need to grapple with was what was it all about? Was it all a hoax? He thought it'd be a, a nice trick to play on the world. And so he went through all that pain for that. What was this all about? You've got to give an answer to who Jesus was and you've got to know. You've got to deal with it because our life is a vapor, as the Bible says. It's just over. Just like this week, and again, those, those the four teenagers in Camarillo, in addition to them. It was just over. Who died in that car accident. Oh, what, a, what a difficult thing to go through. What a horrible thing to have to go through. And last week, uh, a guy who's been to our church a few times um, was with his son in the backyard and did his old shopping cart and lived by the train tracks. They thought it'd be fun to try to tie a rope to it and hook it onto this, this freight train as it was going by. And the rope got caught up in the dad's leg and the son's chasing him, trying to free his dad and drug him to his death. And, uh, and I thought, okay, when he came here to church, who, who sat next to him? And, and what, uh, what, what, what type of interaction did he have with the congregation? Um, you know, I, I, do you have any clue what's even going on in the person's life next to you? You know, we, we, we sit by people each week and... And, uh, and a lot of times we don't even dig deep and say, what's, what's really going on in your life? Can I, can I pray for you for anything? Because that's what the, the early church was. It, that's what God intended for the church to be, where people's like, oh, you're, you're hurting? You know, oh, you, you lost your job? You know what? Uh, let, me sell, let me sell some stock and, and give you some money because we're a family here. It just does, it doesn't really matter. Are you hurting this week? You know, let me cook you some meals. Let me, let me mow the lawn for you at least. Let me clean your house. Let me do something for you. Because when one part of the body hurts, the rest of us grieve with them. And I, and I just think, okay, what, what type of love do people experience when they walk in this room? Do they just walk in and listen to a guy stand on a stage and, and try to speak eloquently uh, about Scripture and, and, and hear some music or this and that? Or, or are they really experiencing church? We are the church. You know, not what takes place on the stage or a building. We are the church. And do people experience that? Um, Every week, people come in hurting. I, I was reading through the prayer request this morning from last week. And just again, every week I read that, I, I get blown away, just going, man, I have no clue. There are so many people that are hurting. And every week in this room, there are people that have just, just feel like they're at the end of their lives. Every week, there are people that come in this room, and, and, and they're, they're dealing with sin. You're, you're dealing with stuff that, that maybe you were strong with for, for so long and then you, you caved in this week and you feel terrible about your life. Then you think about the cross and you realize it's that sin that put on there and you just, you're, you're longing for forgiveness. You're longing to just move on from it. And then there are people who come in as liars every week that just pretend everything's fine and, and, and just hide their sin. Meanwhile, you've been addicted to all sorts of garbage. Some of you are cheating on your spouses right now and it's just, it's just so sick that you're even in the room. And you'd call yourself a Christian. And you hide and you feel terrible, especially as I'm speaking right now. You feel like garbage. And you should. Breaking the heart of God. Grieving the Holy Spirit. And yet you'll lie about it. And I sure hope you don't come to church and feel comfortable. Because how can you come in the presence of the cross and feel okay about your sin? Whatever it is. You just think, you went through that so that I would no longer have to do this. In fact, it says in, uh, in 1 Peter 2.24, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. 